started. It's a great pleasure to have, to have Kyle Parsley here. Kyle got his uh, PhD in 2012 from Columbia, working with Andrea Del Corridor, and did postdocs at uh, Princeton and Berkeley before making the wise career decision to work for the most reliable employer <laughs> we have, the federal government. Um, so between, between the shutdowns, we managed to get him out here. Uh, and he's going to tell us about um, some work on, on um, black hole magnetospheres, which really is a milestone. Um, I, I remember reading the Blanford Zaniac paper for the first time, and they're talking about how pair charges would be self-consistently created in these gaps where there's electric fields, and they'd make a magnetosphere and extract energy. And I, and I, I imagine, you know, what a fantastical idea. Will we ever really see that happen in our lifetime? Well, there's a picture from it. Um, so I'm super excited to, to hear Kyle tell us what he's found. All right. Thanks a lot, Sam. It's great to be here. Thanks a lot for the, the invitation to speak to you all. So I'm going to be telling you about some kinetic plasma uh, simulations I've been doing about looking at plasmas around rotating black holes. So a lot of this stuff, in a way, has been inspired by the idea of how do you take a picture of a black hole. So we think we know a lot about what goes on around black holes. So all that information comes from unresolved sources. So we can see spectra, we can see light curves, and you can infer a lot from that. But you can imagine it would be very exciting if you could actually resolve it as an image and look in much more detail about things that are going on on the scale of the event horizon. And so this New York Times article said you do it with a telescope as big as the Earth. And you know, this is one of the few departments where I don't have to really sell this stuff as much. But uh, <laughs> by as big as the Earth, we mean the event horizon telescope where you, as you probably know better than me, sync up a bunch of different radio observatories around the Earth and do uh, very long baseline interferometry in order to get very high angular resolution to look at the black holes at the center of Milky Way and <coughs> M87. So the two main targets of the HD are galactic center black hole, which has a, an apparent size in the sky of five microns seconds or a billionth of a degree. So it's very, very tiny, but if you use this VLBI technique, you can actually get down to those kinds of resolutions. Uh, and the other one, which is in a way for us even more exciting is M87, and the reason it's more exciting is because there's this clear visible relativistic jet. So the idea is that if you can really resolve things that are going on down at the event horizon scale of M87, you can start learning things about how relativistic jets are all. <coughs> so the EHD is very exciting. There's also this gravity instrument, which is uh, near infrared interferometry on the Very Large Telescope Array in Chile. So the idea is instead of putting all the data onto hard drives, bringing all the hard drives together, and doing it post-processing. They actually do the inf interferometry on the fly in situ with this beam combiner in instrument. So the, the imaging isn't as uh, high resolution, but they get very good resolution for their astrometry. And they've recently had some very nice results showing orbiting hotspots down near the roughly in a most stable circular orbit scale of Sagittarius A star. So for K-band interferometry, there are interesting, interesting things on the horizon as well as it were. So you may be interested in knowing if you're gonna be doing all these exciting observations, what do you do on the theory side? So how do we model the plasmas that are gonna be making the emission that you see with EHT and with gravity? So the question is, how do you model a relativistic plasma? And I'm gonna be talking about these kind of three main ideas. So the most basic or most physically complete one is plasma kinetics. So this is when you're not making any assumptions you're keeping all of the physics, you're solving for the distribution function of all of your particles, your electrons, your positrons, your protons, your whatever you have, and the electromagnetic fields. So there's a lot going on, you have all of the physics, but it's very computationally expensive, as you might imagine, if you're trying to, to keep all of that kind of information. So you can simplify things by making a fluid approximation and taking moments of the distribution function to find things like density, velocity of the plasma if you assume that it's acting like a fluid, and then you get to the somewhat simplified version, which is magnetohydrodynamics. And then you can go further still by making more assumptions. Say you could say that the magnetic field is very, very strong, and if magnetic field strength is d squared, the energy density of the magnetic field is much, much even than the rest mass energy density. You can go to the force-free approximation. And here, your plasma dynamics has gotten very much simpler because you can basically put all your plasma physics just in the current density term and just solve Maxwell's equations. So this one is just Maxwell's equations with some funny stuff going on in the current, which gives you all your plasma physics. So what's the state of the art for looking at the kind of plasmas that are around these black holes? 
So at the moment, the kind of most complete thing that people have done is doing these fluid type MHD simulations of accretion. So this is kind of one of these torus-based GRMHD accretion simulations. So the idea is that you have a black hole down here, all the stuff starts out <coughs> far away, you allow it to become turbulent and unstable, starts to accrete onto the central black hole. And then you can do things like make observational predictions by doing ray tracing. So you have all of your GR effects, because you can do all of this in the curved background, but you've treated the accretion flow as a fluid. So the unfortunate thing is that the flows that we're most interested in don't actually behave like fluids. So at very low accretion rates, you have very low density. And what happens is you have the individual particles in the plasma don't collide often enough in order to isotropize, to thermalize, to make it behave like a fluid. So what happens is collision mean-free path is much, much larger than all system scales. Collision time scales are much bigger than the accretion time scales. And therefore, you don't expect the electrons to thermalize, the positrons to thermalize, protons to thermalize, or all the distributions to come to some <coughs> kind of thermal equilibrium. So if you actually want to make realistic predictions for what the radiation coming from these flows is, you need to take a step back and take a more physically complete uh, way of doing things, which is Gosman kinetic. And this is true not just for these low-level velocity accretion flows, but also many other cases. For example, the corona above an accretion disk, even if the disk itself is dense and collisional and you can use MHD without making any big mistakes, the corona above it, which is making, say, the X-rays, is often in a collisionless or marginally collisionless state. And then most interesting, the jets that uh, black holes launch are almost all low density. And so you don't really want to be using MHD in that case. So if you think about the jets that are launched by a black hole, you may assume that, well, you have a lot of this stuff that's spiraling in in the accretion flow, and you see stuff getting shot out. So what's probably happening is stuff is going from the accretion flow and getting shot out. But that's not actually what's going on, because all this stuff can't cross magnetic field lines into this jet launching region. So what appears to be happening is that you have a region in the jet where you have basically near vacuum conditions because any plasma here, some particles are going to fall into the black hole, some are going to get ejected to large radii, and you're going to come to a near vacuum region where you have large parallel electric fields. So it's basically an electrostatic uh, region. And in that kind of region, the MHD approximation also breaks down. So there's no way of actually figuring out how much plasma you have in the jet just using the MHD <coughs> equation. So any MHD simulations you've seen, where you have relativistic jets, all of that plasma is just coming from some density floor that's been put in there in order to keep the simulation stable. It's not kind of being realistically modeled in a way that you can actually make predictions or observations from it. So all of this is coming from a non-MHD process, pair creation. And so with MHD, you can't predict the location of these gaps, the density of the jet, the composition of the jet, all things like that. So if you want to understand jet emission and how jets work, you need to go beyond MHD and go to plasma kinetics. So what is plasma kinetics? So it's the most basic description of a plasma, which is Maxwell's equations for the electromagnetic fields. And then for the particle component, you can either think of it as a continuum problem, where you have the distribution function and phase space for the, all of your different particle species. Or you can just think of it as pure particle dynamics, where you have the evolution equations for the, uh, the momentum and the positions of all of your different particles. So what we're going to do is we're going to choose this particle-based method, which can be thought of in some ways as solving the distribution function method by characteristics. And we're going to do a particle and cell plasma simulation in which we try to keep all of the general relativistic terms in order to do the most realistic simulation we can of what's going on inside these black holes. <coughs> so in terms of doing collisionless physics in GR, there's been a lot of interesting work done over the years. So this is stellar dynamics, not plasma physics. So this is the collapse of a collisionless star cluster using a particle method. This is a kind of a similar uh, simulation done using a continuum distribution function method. Uh, more recently, there's been some stuff done in multi-dimensions in this uh, kind of case. In terms of plasmas, there's only been one-dimensional simulations. So this is uh, a Schwarzschild black hole, kind of some simple plasma stuff going on in 1D. This is a more recent case where you have stuff going on outside one particular field line for a rotating black hole. but since all of these are only one-dimensional, you're not able to do the kind of full problem in a more self-consistent uh, self consistent way. Because in 1D, you have to impose <coughs> important aspects of the problem, like what's the current being carried on the field line that you're simulating. 
Whereas in a multi-dimensional simulation, you can actually allow all of these things to emerge in the simulation self consistently. So we're interested in coming up with a way of doing multi-dimensional simulations of plasmas aside black holes. So in order to do this, we need to develop some new numerical methods in order to ex extend the particle and cell technology that's been around for a long time into the strong gravity regime. So plasma genetics is two things, fields and particles. If we look at the field uh, component first, this is by far the simpler one. You can write down your electromagnetic field equations in a strong gravitational field in this very nice way in which it looks just like macroscopic Maxwell's equations, right? You have your E, B, V, H fields, and all of your general relativity has been hidden in the constitutive relations and in these extra, you know, the fact that these are spatial derivatives in some kind of curved space. And what's happening here is you're going to have all of this curved density being determined by your particle component. So this is somewhat straightforward to solve. The only tricky bit is the fact that your electric field and magnetic field that go into these curl terms now depend on the other one, right? So the electric field also depends on the magnetic field, and the magnetic field depends on the electric field. So that adds some complication, but it's nothing too problematic. On the other hand, the particles get quite complicated. So if you start from just the general four-dimensional action for a particle in a, uh, in a general metric, you can kind of go through all your usual things to find Hamilton's equations and find this is the evolution equations for particles in this C plus one uh, uh, way of looking at things where you look at the particles moving in some two-dimensional space in time, which makes it a lot easier than kind of thinking in a four-dimensional way. So these equations, particularly this one here for the momentum, get quite complicated. So this is the Lorentz force here. You have something which just, this just looks like the gravitational acceleration here. Uh, this kind of looks like the, uh, the geodesic equation, if you, you know, if you remember what that looks like in 4D, it's kind of a three-dimensional version of that. So you have a lot of additional terms you don't usually have to deal with in plasma physics. So we needed to come up with a new integrator for solving all of these in a well-behaved way. So what do people usually do? So ideally, you would want a symplectic integrator. And by symplectic, we mean that it preserves the symplectic two-form of phase space. And the reason you ideally want to do that is because generally when you do that, you get very good energy stability. And you can imagine if you're running your simulation for a long time, you don't want the particles to gain or lose energy in an unphysical way. Because one of the things you're most interested in getting from the simulation is where does heating and acceleration of particles come. So you don't want the particles to be bleeding or gaining energy from places they shouldn't be doing that and throwing off the interpretation. So for this reason, plasma physicists tend to use something called the Boris push for the electromagnetic terms, which is not symplectic, but it is volume preserving, which is close. And this has been shown to have very good energy properties. So for example, this is just a simple test problem where you use a second order Boris algorithm here and the same thing done by a higher order method that doesn't have these nice properties and you get worse behavior even though it's higher order. So ideally you want to be doing something that conserves the things that you are interested in conserving for energy reasons. So the way we decided to do this was by doing this uh, time symmetric strand split where we break the electromagnetic terms and do a half push of those and a full push of all the other stuff in the momentum equation, all those coordinate things and the other particle, and then do another push here. So the strand split maintains the phase space volume parts. So if this Boris step here, so actually, I should say this. Okay, so what we do here is we can do our electromagnetic terms using a Boris rotation in the local frame where the particle is being considered and then that's volume conserving. For this part here, we're just going to do an implicit symplectic integrator for moving the particle and taking account of the coordinate terms in the momentum equation. And the reason this needs to be implicit is because the Hamiltonian is not separable. And that's just because the uh, Lorentz factor fuses our momentum and space degrees of freedom, right? Because you basically have, this is the inverse spatial metric going into your momentum terms. So this is the spatial dependence and this is momentum dependence. So you can't separate the Hamiltonian nicely and that forces you to use an implicit integrator. So they hopefully will be able to use only a small number of iterations and won't become too expensive. And then we do another half push of this guy. So this gives us most of the nice properties we want without being so expensive that it makes our calculation unfeasible because we want to be able to use a lot of particles. 
So let's do some simple tests of, of the uh, project <coughs> composure. So I'm going to start with a rotating black hole with a high spin. So I'm looking down. So the black hole is rotating like this. This is the horizon. It's the black green of the orbitosphere boundary. And we're going to start with this probate order with these very particular choices. And you'll see why <coughs> I'm choosing these very particular values in a second. So we send the particle in, it goes through the orbitosphere, orbits around the black hole, and then it comes out and it makes this kind of trefoil shape where it goes back and eats its own tail. If you look much later on, it just goes over itself because you have this kind of beautiful periodic orbit. So the fact that this is maintained after going over m many, many times tells you that you're having some nice energy conservation properties where the particle isn't needing energy and going off onto other orbits. So this is with a relatively large, but still somewhat small time step. If you use a much larger time step, gravitational radius divided by C, just a light crossing time of the horizon, you still get some pretty nice behavior. So that's telling you that the conservation properties are doing the right thing. So instead of using the, the new integrator I was telling you about, if you just say, look, I want to just do something simpler, I just want to use Lanjikata, why not? You'll find that you get all sorts of crazy things happening when you use larger time steps. So this tells you that the conservation properties are breaking down and your particles are gaining and losing energy where they shouldn't be. So this tells us that we should be doing the thing that we spent all the time driving. But this is just <coughs> this implicit step, right? Because you don't have the Lorentz force yet. Exactly. You're not using this voice at all. Exactly. So just, okay. Yeah, purely the gravitational coordinate terms can give you this kind of thing. So you would expect that there is convergence, right? So do you converge when you take more time steps with the uh, yeah, they'll definitely converge. I mean, it's just a question and, and of... And what is the... I mean, how much smaller would you need to actually have the time step to get the same solution? We didn't do a detailed check of that. The people who have done this for plasma physics, there's a lot of interest in higher order <coughs> schemes for plasma physics, and people have generally found that you're better off <coughs> using lower order uh, schemes with conservative properties than going to higher order with, let's say, one of schemes. So we were kind of tr trying to leverage that knowledge. But to some extent, you could always use small time steps and uh, for this, but I think it'll just end up being more expensive. Okay, so this is purely geodesics. So in our problem, we're also gonna have electromagnetic fields. So here we're going to add magnetic and electric fields. So this is a rotating black hole with a uniform field. So again, you're looking down on the axis of rotation. So now there's a uniform magnetic field coming out of the board, and this whole thing is rotating around. So the particle is being shot, and it's doing cyclotron motion as it's being ejected around by the rotating magnetic field. So if you use the integrator I was describing, you get some pretty good conservative behavior. It comes back to where it starts from. Whereas if you just do a direct uh, Runge-Kutta step, you rapidly bleed energy, and you get to a very different solution. So this is encouraging that when you put the whole thing together, you still get good behavior, and there might be some you actually would want to use for a large simulation. And where are the <coughs> green and black lines here? The green is the ergosphere boundary, and black is the horizon. And so let's see, the RK fourth order is sort of the much more common. Is there a reason you're comparing to the third? Is there more? I mean, there's no particular reason. I, mean, I guess I wanted a, an example that would show the two things being different. Uh, so third is worse than fourth, um, because you know the idea is that you want something that's well behaved for many, 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 many orbits. This is just something that it comes bad very quickly. So you could go to arbitrary order in our case. Okay, so that's enough for particle tests for now. So what's the problem I'm going to be mostly talking about? So, so is that with a fixed black hole? Yeah. Okay. So everything I'm going to do is just fixed curve metric. There's going to be no space-time evolution or any of this. And the large value of spin, is there, what's the reason for that? For doing camp? Yeah, just for doing camp. So part of this is just going to be to show that there's no, nothing breaks down, there's nothing, there's nothing bad in the numerics when you go to very high spin. So, but you could use anything you want. Okay, so the first problem is going to be the sort of classic Rosetta Stone problem, the uh, magnetospheric wall problem. So the idea is you have a rotating black hole, in a uniform magnetic field, and then you form these different uh, solutions. I'm going to show you what you start with in vacuum, 
how it transitions to these different things. The slide is just to show that this, can, this has been looked at you know, for a long time in MHD, force field electrodynamics. So this is this MHD and this very high magnetic field limit. And this is the kind of time, time independent version of force field electrodynamics. So what does this look like? So this is going to be just an example calculation of what happens in force field. So you start with this uh, uniform magnetic field. You let the thing run. You form a current sheet at the equator, which gradually starts reconnecting, moves towards the ergosphere boundary, which is this green line. So now we're looking in the poloidal plane. The uh, up here is the rotation axis. This uh, red line is the inner light surface. So you get towards this kind of long-term quasi-steady state where you have a current sheet extending from the horizon to the ergosphere boundary. You have a toroidal magnetic field in what looks like a jet region here. So you have energy being extracted up into the jet region by these magnetic field lines, which are twisting around in a helix. So this is basically the state that we want to investigate using our kinetic method. So the idea is we're going to try to get a kinetic simulation that's going to have a lot of plasma. So it's going to be nearly in this force-free limit. So we want to basically produce this with a particle simulation to see what's the plasma distribution that makes it. So the setup is you need to set a bunch of characteristic quantities for the problem. So we want it to be very well magnetized. So we're going to have a very small gyro radius of our particle. So we're going to choose a thousandth of the gravitational radius. And by choosing that, that sets the magnetic field strength at large distances. So at large distances, it just goes to a uniform field. So if we choose this, it also effectively chooses our uh, density of particles in zero. So this is just the characteristic density that is produced when you have this magnetic field strength and whatever rotation rate of black hole you choose. So omega h here is the uh, angular velocity of the horizon. And this also gives you this characteristic magnetization. So this is d squared energy density in the magnetic field divided by energy density of this characteristic particle population. And here this characteristic magnetization is around 2,000. So you're going to be mostly going to a very magnetically dominated situation, which is what we kind of are interested in for jet problems. So most importantly here, we have this astrophysically relevant scale hierarchy. So the idea is that the Larmor radius of our particles is much smaller than the plasma skin depth. So the plasma skin depth is the spatial scale of electrostatic oscillations inside the plasma. And the plasma skin depth is much less than gravitational radii. So in reality, there's a much larger scale separation than we're able to do in the simulations in any realistic sim situation. But the idea is that we compress the scale separation in order to actually make the simulation possible. So hopefully most of the, the behavior will be captured even if the scale separation isn't quite what it is in reality. And so how do we inject particles? So the idea is that we start from vacuum, and then we have a simple prescription for injecting plasma into the simulation. So the idea is that how is plasma produced in a jet? So the idea is that you have, if you have an electric field along a magnetic field line, parallel electric field, that would cause the charged particle to accelerate. Accelerated particles emit photons. So you'd have a high energy photon that would then interact with a background photon you'd get from any kind of accretion flow. And then you'd have interaction of those two would give you two photon pair position. So rather than tracking all of that right now, we're just kind of short circuiting the process and saying when you have large parallel electric fields, we're going to inject uh, an electron positron pair. So we set a threshold uh, above which you need a above which you need to have parallel electric field in order to give you pairs. The idea is that the smaller the threshold, the more plasma you get. So if we say 10 to the minus 3 in this dw over d square quantity, we're going to have a lot of plasma because high plasma supply. If we make it a bit larger, we're going to have less plasma. So the interesting thing, just to kind of <coughs> tell you the punchline first, is that we're going to see two very different states of the plasma for these two different thresholds, even though these numbers are small, and therefore parallel electric fields are everywhere small. So even though you're close to the force free solution everywhere, the plasma distribution is going to be very, very different. And that's going to basically say that you need to do something like this in order to infer what the distribution of plasma is, because there's no way a priori to know energy. OK. Is, is this, are you using invariance here, or is this a, a frame, a choice of frame? This is just in the, yeah, this is the, the normal observation. So if you had tried to use invariance, right, 
e dot b would be invariant. I don't know how d is defined, but e dot b is invariant. But then the invariant thing for d squared would be d squared minus e squared, right? Would yeah. if you just put d squared minus e squared in the denominator, would that screw something up? I mean, if you, if b becomes close to e, then okay, I'll go break through this. But yeah. So in the current issue, we would have regions where d squared becomes smaller than e squared, such that um, we were trying to just keep it simple for now and not make any particular claims or anything. It was far from being. Yeah, invariant. but it'd be interesting to make because there should be some. If you know, microphysics is Lorentz invariant underlying this description, so there, there ought to be something. Is it possible? Right. I mean, I think beyond this, the plan is to just put in the pair creation process in a more realistic way with Monte Carlo and try to do it all okay. more correctly okay. rather than try to uh, pretty this up as much as we can. Okay. So this is what the initial conditions look like. So this is just oh, the vacuum uh, wall solution. So this is a rotating black hole. So this is the horizon of the sphere boundary. This is our uniform magnetic field at large radii, which close to the black hole is forced to go around outside the horizon. So this is the vacuum solution with the Meissner effect, where the uh, magnetic field lines are forced to go outside the horizon. So you can construct this very nice steady state solution just with the, the symmetry, basically, of the space time. So it's a very beautiful solution. But what's interesting here, and what's shown in the color, is that you have large parallel electric fields in this initial solution. So you're going to have a lot of injection of plasma from the very, very beginning. So especially here, where d dot b is very large, you're going to inject a lot of plasma, which is going to carry currents and strongly modify the solution. OK, so this is the. The first simulation, so this is going to be our high plasma supply scenario where you have a fairly small threshold, so it's going to want to supply a lot of plasma to the problem. So I'm going to show uh, electron density on the left, positron density on the right. These are axisymmetric simulations, so it's just a colloidal frame, and I've just flipped one to the other side so you can see the two things at the same time. Okay. So these are field lines here. So you set the whole thing going. You inject a lot of plasma everywhere and drive currents, which cause the magnetic field distribution to change. A lot of this stuff starts to accumulate at the equator. You get the strong current layer at the equator here. All this stuff is kind of sink sinking down slowly. This is forming stronger and stronger current layers here, which is very smooth until it slowly starts to become unstable to kinetic instabilities. So you have drift kink instability, tearing mode, things like that. So you have a lot of stuff that's interesting in this current sheet, high current region here, and like dissipation. Things are generally fairly simple out here. And you have kind of the return current in this region outside the jet. So you see kind of a plasmoid forming there in the electron density. So what's happening here is these magnetic field lines are being wound around into a helix and are extracting energy up into what's effectively a jet region here. Even though you can't really see it in the particle distribution, you're seeing electromagnetic energy coming out of the black hole. But for the most part, on some level, it looks kind of boring, right? This is all just smooth and well-behaved. You're having interesting stuff happening in the field. Okay. So we are able to look at collisionless plasma instabilities now in full GR. So this is kind of a zoom in on the current layer where you see all these magnetic islands being formed in the density from the tearing instability. So you, if you have these current sheets happening from an accretion flow around the black hole, this is how you can get X-rays, gamma rays from black holes. So now we can sort of looking at those in full GR in a global context, which is interesting for kind of compared to high energy observation. Okay, so our second scenario is this low plasma supply one where we use a larger threshold. So we're gonna basically demand more power than electric field before we give it a pair. So we see what happens. So it's the same as the last one otherwise. And initially it does more or less the same thing. It injects a lot of plasma, you get a lot of stuff accumulating at the equator. It looks like it's going to more or less the same solution, except that at a certain stage, it starts real realizing it doesn't have enough plasma to form the global current structure without forcing some of the particles to counter stream. So if you want to get the maximum current from a particle population, you're going to have the two charged species going in opposite directions, right? So that's what it's doing here. It's forcing the electrons to go out, the positrons are going in inside the jet, and then vice versa in this return layer here. So it transitions to this very different solution, which is still roughly a force-free solution, a kind of a gross sense, but if you look at the actual particle population, it's very different. The density is much lower, it's much more charge separated, uh, you actually have counter streaming of particles, um, so this would actually have very different observational manifestations than the previous one, even though from an electrodynamic point of view, 
both very close to the kind of basic force field solution of the building block. So if we look at what what the solution looked like, so this is the density structures we were looking at. So this is what I was saying about the velocities, that in the high density state, it's basically sinking slowly everywhere. So the current is being produced because the positrons are sinking slightly faster than the electrons, so that causes the current. But because there's so much plasma, you can produce enough current just by having a small bit mismatch in the rate at which the two particle populations go down. And you can see the particles going in at the equator in this green layer here. But if you look at the low plasma state, now all the electrons in this jet region here are being forced to go out. So you're having counter streaming of particles here, right? Positrons go in, electrons go out. But because nothing can come out of the horizon, it means that they're all the electrons must be going in near the horizon. And if they're going out here and in here, there must be some separation surface. Right? So this gold line here is the inner light surface of the magnetic field distribution. So what you can look at is, given magnetic field lines, you can say what's the surface at which co-rotating with the magnetic field line without changing your radial position would be moving at the speed of light, would be a null world line. And that's this uh, light surface here. So you see that the point at which your electron population changes direction basically exactly coincides with the light surface, which makes a lot of sense. And then vice versa, if you look at the positrons, here they're going out uh, along this kind of jet boundary region, where in here they're, they're all going in as they have to be going into the horizon. And so similarly, you get the, the two changing directions at the inner light surface. How do you, um, uh, how do you apply an inflow boundary condition that doesn't assume the solution? So there's no inflow uh, boundary condition. So what happens is at large radii, it basically acts like an absorbing layer, so no waves can go out to the outer boundary. <coughs> so we're just supplying plasma everywhere where it's being demanded. So whenever you have that parallel electric field, you give it some plasma, and that plasma can do whatever it wants. It can go in, it can go out. So you don't need inflow boundary, boundary conditions in order to get this kind of sinking. Were you asking about the black hole? Yeah. Uh, no, no, I was just oh. asking at the outer boundary if mm -hmm. matter is coming through the outer boundary, what, uh, how do you know what properties to give it? Mm -hmm. I guess you just uh, you give it whatever it needs. Yeah, so we don't have any, so what happens is the box is terminated at eight gravitational radii. There's a layer between eight and seven, which is absorbing layer to stop waves from getting to the outer boundary and causing problems. And then you only have injection up to six. So there's basically <coughs> a finite region in which you inject plasma. And then that plasma can do whatever. We're, we're not seeing that here. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's been truncated out, out here or something like that. Okay. So, yeah. You mentioned the surface uh, light cylinders, and they you defined it as a surface where the magnetic field lines correlate. Um, now, the, there's a well defined notion of an angular velocity of magnetic field lines and force free electrodynamics. But here, you're not entirely force free. It's not clear to me what, what, what regime you're in. So how do you define the angular velocity of magnetic field lines here? It's the same way you're probably thinking of. It's just the, the ratio of... Of the stress of, of the micro... Uh, yeah, the it's like F percent. e to phi over F. But, that, but that's meaningful, or at least it's motivated based on the force field electrodynamics. So it's not... I think it's... Not in general, right? If particles are tied to magnetic field lines, if particles are well magnetized, then moving with that angular velocity will basically they'll be trapped in the magnetic field line. So I think it's mostly assuming well magnetized rather than than anything else. But you know, yeah. E is you keep it below ten to the minus two, right? Yeah. So that's pretty force free. It's pretty close. Yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, yeah. yeah. We should yeah we we should talk about that later. Okay. Okay. So the other thing that's interesting here is this central panel, which is the energy at infinity of particles. So you can think of the energy at infinity as basically the conserved energy of particles have if they were moving on geodesics. So for any individual particle, it's just the uh, one of the, that, the part of the forward velocity that's conserved along geodesics. So this should generally be positive, and everywhere outside the ergosphere it has to be positive just by geometry. But inside the ergosphere, you can have these weird situations where you have negative energy of particles. And it's strange because if you actually were right next to the particle and did anything to it, you'd you know, measure it to have positive energy. 
but sort of as a distant observer, it in some sense appears to have negative energy. And what we find here is that we get a fairly large population of particles which have this uh, negative energy property. So all of this blue stuff here is where the kind of average energy and affinity of the particles at that location is negative. And this is mostly happening in the current sheets, but in the low density case, you also have these negative energy particles on this jet blue line. And this, remember, is roughly where you have the turnover between ingoing and outgoing electrons in the jet region. So it's interesting that you have basically a connection between the launching of electromagnetic jets via this uh, twisting of magnetic field lines and this negative energy situation. So the negative energy particles led to this idea proposed by Roger Penrose back in the 1960s that you can have extraction of rotational energy of black holes from the ingestion of these negative energy particles. So you may have heard of the idea that you have a particle that splits in two and one goes out with greater positive energy and one gets eaten by a black hole with negative energy and that extracts the black hole's rotational energy. And this is somewhat similar, you still have negative energy but there's no disintegration. What's happening is that the particle is being acted on by the Lorentz force from the plasma. You have all these electromagnetic fields that are being produced. The Lorentz force can push it onto these negative energy trajectories. And then when these particles cross the horizon, in some sense, they extract the energy, or the rotational energy of the black hole. OK. So looking at the gross electrodynamic solution, so similar to the force free solution I showed you before, you kind of get something which you might expect, where you have a large amount of total magnetic field as these things are being twisted into a, a helix, which is extracting the rotational energy from the black hole. If you look at the currents, you have a lot of, this is a, the norm of the four currents, so this is a lot of space-like current here, which is the idea that you have uh, counter-spinning in some sense. And this would be uh, current along the magnetic field lines. So you have kind of a, a large region here of uh, volume return current in this kind of spinner region is kind of a strong current there at the boundary of the jet. So this is for the high plasma supply, the first simulation I showed. The low plasma supply one is more kind of diffuse, but it's basically the same. And that's because they're both very similar to this force-free solution. So from this point of view, they both look very similar. If you look at something like... Uh, can, can you go back? Yeah. You said the current is space-like, so based on your color map, it seems to be not. I mean, it looks white. Yeah, so there's a lot of knowledge stuff here. It's space like in the in the current layer and also kind of at the poles here. And then there's a lot of nearly null and null stuff. So if you look at the um, average particle Lorentz factors, so we're interested in particle acceleration because you want to see high energy particles which may produce high energy photons that you can observe. In the high plasma supply case, all of this stuff here is just smoothly sinking, remember our velocity map, so nothing really interesting happens here. You get a lot of acceleration of particles in these current layers where you have large electric fields. Yeah? How do you determine the initial ejection of the particles into the distribution? Right, so we sample them randomly from a local thermal distribution with, with I think it's KT equals 0.5. And you're not worried about non-thermal half scales or anything like that, that mm -hmm. things? Not at this point. The idea is that we inject them with a, a low enough thermal spread that anything else is, is coming from the simulation. Okay. And if you look at the low plasma supply case, because these particles are being forced to higher energies in order to carry the current, you get a lot more energy particles in this jet region here and a lot more acceleration of particles in the current layer here. And it's interesting here that especially the positrons, the current is the area where you have a lot of energetic positrons is much larger than the width of the current layer itself. And because these particles are being accelerated to high energies and are leaving the current layer and interacting with strong magnetic fields outside the current layer, you'd be expecting to get a lot of synchrotron emission from those particles. So at the moment, this is a fairly idealized problem, as you can see. But going forward, you can imagine that you can start making predictions for you know, particle spectra, light curves, things like that, if you know the field structure and the spectrum of accelerated particles kind of more realistic cases. And then, sort of the most interesting thing is just the flux of energy from the black hole. So in this plot, which is quite busy, the main panels are the energy at infinity flux integrated on spheres as a function of radius for the different channels. So this is slightly cut off. The blue is electrons, red is positrons, gold is pointing, and black is total. 
So you can see, for example, in the high plasma supply case, you have basically most of the energy is sinking into the black hole from the particle channel. It's being extracted in the electromagnetic channel. Uh, these are two different times. So you see some areas where it's greater than zero from the particles. So that's extraction of energy by this kind of Penrose like process. In the low plasma supply case, you get this nice bump at certain times near the horizon where energy is being taken out by this particle, this particle method. But if you look at the insets, which is just the, the flux on the horizon as a function of time, it's a lot clearer. It's in this kind of long-term quasi-steady state. It's basically dominated by this electromagnetic energy flux. So this is basically the Blanchard's IF mechanism, where you have this twisted rotating magnetic field line extracting energy by electromagnetic fields. But you also have regions where, in this case, it's the electrons, where the energy flux from the electrons is greater than zero. And this is particularly true here, where you don't have that much energy flowing in because it's a low density situation. You have a lot of the energy coming in through a current sheet. And because of that current sheet energy, a lot of those particles have negative energy. You get these large spikes of, of energy, negative energy going in, positive energy going out. So that's this uh, particle-based extraction of energy, which is kind of the late in the Penrose idea. So this is kind of interesting because it shows that these two channels can, in some cases, be roughly comparable in some cases. So most of the kind of Penrose power is coming from this current sheet region, where you have a lot of these negative energy particles, high density of particles where the current sheet is formed. But you could expect that in a more realistic case, this is where your accretion flow is going to be, right? You have stuff spiraling in, coming in roughly at the equator-ish. And this will all just be swamped by the accretion flow. So it's interesting to think, firstly, how would this look in a more realistic case where you have a lot of accreting matter? And that's something that we're look interested in looking at in, uh, in future. But also, how else can you get current sheets? So current sheets beyond the kind that are produced in this fairly idealized <coughs> situation here. And so one uh, way of doing that is by using different magnetic field structures that are being sourced from the, from the disk. So this is something I did a few years ago in a very different context, but it kind of shows the same idea where you have, here you have a rotating black hole, the unit's the ergosphere. This is a force-free simulation. The idea is that you have these different loops or structures of magnetic fields sourced by the accretion disk, which would be the, the mid plane here. So this is a retrograde accretion flow. So the accretion disk is rotating here. The black hole is rotating into the board. This is the ISCO out here. And what you're going to see in color is the toroidal magnetic field. So you set the whole thing running. These things are opened by the shear in the disk. They form a jet. And then you get these current sheets that are produced in near the black hole when these smaller field structures are forced to, to be killed off. And you see the current sheet extending into the ergosphere here and extending all the way down to the horizon. So because the current sheet is inside the ergosphere, you can, in principle, have these negative energy states of particles. So if you had something like this happening where you had the jet sourced from these small scale loops of magnetic field created by the accretion disk, you could have a lot of the energy being killed off or being di di dissipated in these current sheets, some of which might go into these negative energy particles. So that's one way that this could actually become more realistic. Okay, so just to summarize, um, this is the first collision plasma simulation, multidimensional in, in full GR. So the interesting thing from to kind of the, to zoom back out of all of this is we see the Blanford's Nair process extraction of, of energy from the black hole by the electromagnetic field on a particle kinetic level. So it's uh, you need to have electric currents to make the magnetic field do this, and you're actually seeing individual particles move together to create the currents, which makes the magnetic field produce the jet. So it's kind of a full chain of events. Uh, we also see these negative energy, kind of more exotic Penrose-type particles in both the jet region, showing that this blanford nyack and Penrose processes are kind of related in some way, and in these current sheets, where you expect a lot of the dissipation of energy that's going to go into your high-energy photons, ma making your X-ray corona or possibly gamma rays in the black hole. So it's interesting that these negative energy state may be tied into some of the most interesting aspects of high energy, high energy physics from black holes. And then in the future, the main thing that I mentioned already is doing the pair injection 
more realistically, rather than just having a simple prescription for power electric fields, we actually have particles which are accelerating, emit photons, trap photons, do the whole pair creation in a proper Monte Carlo setup to make it more realistic, see where these electrostatic gaps are created, and see if we can make any kind of predictions for what kind of emission we expect from those. And then finally, is trying to do the full simulation of a traditional secretion flow. So to circle back around to where we started, where we were talking about looking at the emission from BHD, say from Sao J star, most of the emission is coming from the accretion flow itself. So ideally, we'd like to be able to use the collisionless methods to actually study the accretion flow. So work has begun on that in, a, again, a somewhat idealized setup. But you know, going forward, the idea is to keep adding realism to try to study accretion flows with uh, as much physics as we can. So I think I, I can uh, take, your, take your questions. It's a good question. Um, my understanding is that you know, black holes have shown a lot of variability at all time scales. You know, if you look at, you see a lot of flaring, let's say in TEVs from M87s. I think in basically all channels you see a lot of variability, and uh, I think that's one benefit of this kind of, or one selling point of that kind of model is that it can explain a lot of variability in, in the jet dynamics that's hard to explain in a kind of more traditional picture where you just have a large buildup of magnetic field on the black hole. But I'm not sure about the, the detailed uh, population of the, of the variability. You, you extended that movie. Do you, do you expect it to settle down to something or just keep burping? So the way that simulation was set up is you just start out with a certain number of loops. And then because it's axisymmetric, it enforces that kind of cyclical behavior where something's opened and then it gets killed off and then the next one is opened and it's killed off. What's interesting would be to do something like that in 3D where then you have all these different things, these magnetic structures in the disk interacting together and interacting with the black hole. And it would be interesting to see if that would uh, produce a jet in a kind of a steady state way, whether you know the reconnection between the different systems would kill off the jet. Do you have the analog of like a inverse cascade uh, I think in 2D it basically stops anything interesting like that from happening. In 3D you might be able to see an inverse cascade. Yeah. Because these, these magnetic field systems in 2D are basically forced to be kind of separate. They all just like open up and kill within each other. Whereas in 3D they can reconnect across the different field structures. Yeah. So your, your first simulations you were showing, I guess in the high injection case, mm -hmm. You sort of pointed out that it was hard to see where the jet was. I guess I, I don't quite understand where the jet is in that cartoon and how it relates to where I should imagine jet launching happening if I were to observe a, a, an astrophysical outflow. Mm -hmm. So the jet is really just the, the kind of central region where it's just this stuff here, right? So you have these magnetic field lines that are connecting through the horizon to the orbicular boundary and then up here. So all of these are, this is toroidal magnetic fields, so all of these have kind of been wound up, so you just have point and flux coming out of the black hole. So that's the jet. It's kind of confusing because the, mag because the thing is confined to be kind of parallel at large distances, you don't really have a proper ex acceleration of plasma in a kind of a plasma jet. You mostly just have an electromagnetic flux of particles. So if you allow this to be, let's say, quasi-radial, you'd see both particle species going out in something that looks much more jet-like. So yeah, so obviously you're doing pair creation in a particle simulation, so your computational costs presumably start going up once you start creating particles. Is that, I don't know, is that something that ever becomes unsustainable? And is there a plan for yeah. that somehow? Or? Yeah, you'd need to come up with some way of, of living with that. Or, yeah. So at the moment we do pair injection and it does become this kind of quasi-steady thing where it saturates, right? So it, a certain number of particles leave, go into the hole, more created, and it doesn't, the cost doesn't keep growing in time. And hopefully, you know, 
we expect that if you do this with a full pair of patient physics, it would be something somewhat similar. It, it might be intermittent, and you see the pair of patient getting turned off and on and on and off, but on a long enough time scale, we expect it to be on a quasi steady. And, and in terms of this uh, full pair of patient physics, obviously here you just had two different thresholds. Is there, um, do you have any idea yet of what, like, those two scenarios correspond to something, like, in, like mass versus magnetic field, or? So in, in detail, not really. The idea is really that the accretion flow can produce different amounts at different strengths of the radiation bath that allows the perturbation to happen. So if you have kind of a high luminosity accretion flow, you can produce a lot of plasma very easily. That might be the high plasma supply case. If you have a very dim flow without a lot of background photons to make the two pairs, you probably go to the, the low plasma supply case. Also, of course, spin of the black hole is going to go into this as well. If you have a lower spinning black hole, you'll get less particle acceleration. So there's probably some continuum where you go from the kind of thing basically hardly functioning and hardly producing pairs to being very saturated with plasma. And that will depend on a range of different astrophysical things. You, had, you showed the run to cut a method killing off the cyclotron motion. Mm -hmm. Could it have done the reverse, though? Could it have enhanced it? I think yes. So depending on... I was looking at test problems, and depending on which exact runge cutter method you used, you could get different things happening. Particularly second order runge cut off and caused enormous energy gain very quickly. But mostly the higher order ones, I think, are more dissipated. If you look at all of the uh, influx rate of uh, particle accretion, uh, for example, the accretion rate of electrons versus the accretion rate of positrons onto the black hole, is it the same? Does it fluctuate? Um, I think, I mean, it goes towards the force-free solution, of, so that means that you have a, I always get nervous wading into this, but there's kind of a charge on the horizon if you integrate the electric field, right? So you, in the long term, that has to be stable because that's what the force-free solution gives you. So I think that in the kind of quasi-steady case, it's more or less the same because the, the charge on the horizon saturates and just stays at the force free level. Uh, when you say the charge on the horizon, you mean the effective charges you would get if you were to take uh, the divergence of the integral the coefficient? Yeah, so if you just um, integrate the normal electric field on the horizon, mm -hmm. that gives you a charge. That has to stay at roughly the force free level in the, the kind of quasi steady case. So does this mean that there's a net In, in the sense that if you take this integral on the horizon, yes. But this is just well, what you get. Blow, right? I mean exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but that's just what you get from the force free, the force free solution as well. I'm, I'm just nervous because what tends to happen is people are like, oh, so you use charged particles and then you get a charged black hole. It's like black holes are charged. Like, yes. It's something that's just coming from the electrodynamic solution, which is nothing particular to using charged particles. to do the pair creation more realistically. So I would have thought the pair creation is supposed to happen on really small scales. And doing it realistically would mean zooming on those scales and figuring out what's going on and then making your phenomenological prescription a little better motivated. But you want to do the whole thing self-consistently. I mean, am I wrong? I mean, is the pair production happening on large? You, know, you launch a particle halfway across the magnetosphere and it hits another one and it's going to be... I think in some cases right. it can, can be on relatively free path before you get a pair can be large enough that it's worth resolving, okay. at least in some cases. But I mean, that's what people do in pulsars as well, right? Like you have photon tracking and you see where acceleration and particle direction happen. So you kind of plan to kind of learn from the pulsar community and start adding some of that stuff into it. Other questions? We still have a minute. If you want to see something else, I was a bit fast in some places there. I can show you one last one, maybe. So the question, one of the questions you might have asked, if you did, <laughs> which you should have asked me, was particles are strongly magnetized, electromagnetic fields are strong. It's all just electrodynamics, and you're wasting your time with all this gravity stuff. So you could say, why are you wasting your time doing all of this stuff properly? So the, what I did to test this was 
I just said all the metric derivative terms for the flat space time values. So the idea here is you're taking account of the fact that you're using spherical coordinates, so that's all right, but you're basically pretending that you didn't bother with any of the real gravity. So what happens then? So this is, I mean, it's slightly open really, but it's the same kind of thing, but now with no gravity on the particles, and initially does something fairly similar, and now you get a lot of acceleration of particles, which cause unphysical currents to flow because the particles are no longer conserving their energy and momentum correctly because they're not doing the full, the full integration. And that drives these unphysical currents that basically cause the whole simulation to explode. So what this tells you is that if you have accelerated particles, at least, that you actually need to behave like properly. Uh, wait, but your initial conditions are also tied to the initial gravitational solution that you started out with, right? Your field lines look curved. So a metric's a apples with apples comparison. So you're switching off the gravity currents, but your initial conditions are a little bit not, not so consistent, though. So I'm only sending off the graph turning off the gravity in the particles. The fields are all in, being integrated properly. So the idea is that let's say, let's say you, you want to be a bit lazy and not do your particles properly, but you're going to do everything else properly because it's relatively straightforward. What would you get? And so this is what you get. It's obviously not your, it's not self-consistent because you're, you're integrating your particles incorrectly, right? Well, there, there is not a wiki, but you are in the problems. <laughs> <laughs> My kind of people. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, that's that.